Welcome back to Class Time, your, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. It's now time for CSEC Chemistry. I'm Dr. Francine Taylor Campbell, and in today's lesson, we'll be looking at the mole concept. So let's get started. Today, we hope to learn the following. We want to be able to define the mole, molar mass and relative atomic mass, to state Avogadro's number, and to calculate relative atomic mass from isotopic abundances. We'll also be able to calculate relative molecular mass or relative formula mass given atomic masses, and also perform calculations involving the mole. So we'll be guided by a few questions. What is the mole? How big is the mole? And how do we use the mole in calculations? We'll start off with a challenge. I want you to think about this question and you can send in your answers if that's allowed, or you can wait until the end of the program where we'll provide the answer. So this is our mole challenge for today. What do you call a tooth in one liter of water? Think about it and let me know your responses. So what is the mole? When we think of the mole, are we thinking of an animal? If you look up the meaning, probably you would see a particular type of animal. Or are you thinking about that double agent in one of those Bond um, movies? No, that's not what, what we're talking about. We're talking about a unit of measurement in chemistry, which is, which is actually the SI unit of measurement for amount of substance. Now, let's look at other SI units. We have units for uh, measuring length, which is the meter, units for measuring mass, which is the kilogram, and you can think of other SI units. Where chemistry is concerned, when we're comparing amounts of substances, we use the mole. And so the mole in this case would represent a number. All right, so let's see if we can make this a little simpler. When you buy eggs, you will, in the supermarket, you may see the eggs as a dozen eggs, and we know that a dozen represents 12. So whenever we think of a dozen items, we're thinking of 12. If we think of half a dozen, we're thinking of half of that, which is six items. And so whenever we hear the word dozen, we understand that it represents 12 items. In the same way, if we heard about pair, a pair of, of, of uh, anything is two. And one gross would be 144 items. Now, when we think of a mole as a number, what are we talking about? The mole represents, and this is a very big number, 6.02 times 10 to the 20, 23rd power um, particles, all right? And that number is called Avogadro's number, um, and it is named after the, 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 the gentleman who would have worked on this particular concept, Amadio Avogadro. And so these particles can be atoms. So if I have a mole of... Uh, of, of atoms, it would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. If I have a mole of ions, the same thing. If I have a mole of molecules, I would have the same number of particles. And so this is re regarded as a mole. It is a constant value, so it is also called Avogadro's constant. Now, how big is this mole? Now, think of a thousand a million, and keep expanding on that. So a mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd um, particles, represents 60, followed by about 21 or so zeros, right? And essentially, that would be 60.2 sextillion. Probably never heard of that term before, right? So it means that if I have a mole of any substance, the number of particles in that substance is 60.2 sextillion particles. Too big for us to even consider. All right, so how can we use this, this in our, in our uh, practice? Let's demonstrate this. Now, if, I, if we have 0 0.5 moles of sodium, what would that look like? So we start from, from the premise that a mole, so one mole, I think my 
One mole represents 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, right? So one mole of sodium atoms would have this number of particles. So by extension, if I have 0 0.5 moles, what would that be? So this is a half, right? And so basically it would be 0.5 or a half times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which would basically work out to be 3 0.01 times 10 to the 23rd sodium atoms. And so in this particular case, we're reasoning out how we would find the number of units or particles. Let's try one more. Now suppose we were given the number of units and we're asked how many moles are in this, all right? So let's try... Uh, 1.2, so we want to know how many moles are in 1.2 times 10 to the 22nd argon atoms, all right? So again, we start from, from the premise that one mole has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, right? Whatever the particle is. And so if I have 1.2, so I'm trying to find what X is, how many moles, but I know the number of particles is 1.2 times 10 to the 22nd, all right? And therefore, to find X, I would simply divide 1.2 times 10 to the 22nd divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Right? Obviously, it means it, it would be less than one. All right? Good? And that would work out to give us 0 0.02 moles of argon. Okay, we're going to need to get a, a brighter marker. All right, so, so by definition then, a mole is the amount of substance that contains the same number of particles. And what is that number again? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. And these particles we said can be atoms, can be molecules, or can be ions, as there are in 12 grams of carbon 12. And so what, what is done is that the carbon 12, 12 grams of carbon 12, is assigned as one mole, right? And so any substance, a mole of any substance, will have the same number of particles. But the mass may be different. So let's see how we can demonstrate this. Now if you have, for instance, a dozen bananas and a dozen apples, we would expect them to have the same number of items, which is a dozen, which is 12, but the mass may be different. So I've brought uh, something to demonstrate what we're saying. Okay, so we have our balance, our scale, and I have in this particular container, I have 12 balls, I think look like golf balls or something like that, and I have 12 tennis balls, right? So we could count them out if you want, but you can take my word for it that it's 12, all right? So, let's see what the mass is of these 12 golf balls. So this um, set, and we're ne ne negating the, the mass of the, of the container, is 630 grams, right? 630 grams. I guess you will have to take my word for the mass, all right? So it's 12 golf balls, 630 grams. And here we have 12 tennis balls, which we know is much lighter. And that works out to be 71 grams. So we have the same number of particles, but the mass is different. And that's the same idea 
we use in chemistry. Substances can be of the have the same number of particles. That means they are both one mole, for instance, but the mass is different. All right. Now, how do we determine the mass of an atom? So we talk about atomic mass. All right. We would remember that the atom is small, right? It's the smallest division of matter. And when we discussed um, atomic atoms in probably in grade 10, we talk about the atom being um, too small for us to be able to see. So it's invisible, right? And so the mass of an average atom is really very small. In the same way that the, the Avogadro's constant was 10 to the 23rd um, power, the mass of the atom is 10 to the minus uh, 20 odd um, power, right? So it's actually 0 0.000, very, very, very small, all right? And so what chemists use to compare masses of atoms, we use a different unit called an atomic mass unit, or AMU for short. And we use carbon as a standard. So we compare atoms, right, to carbon, where carbon is assigned, the carbon 12 atom is assigned a mass of 12 atomic mass units. And so one twelfth of that would be one atomic mass unit, right? And so everything is compared to carbon. Another time we can discuss why that is so, but we probably don't have the time to do that today. So if you look on your periodic table, you may see, for instance, that magnesium um, is represented as having the mass, the top number, 24, and a bottom number of 12, all right? And so that number at the top is called the atomic mass. And on your periodic table, you, 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 you can see this very clearly, all right? A mole of magnesium has an atomic mass of 24. A mole of carbon has an atomic mass of 12. Again, they are the same number of units. That is, they represent a mole. They have the same number of particles. That is Avogadro's um, number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And this is something you're going to hear over and over. All right? But of course, they have a different mass. So let us just demonstrate one, one, one more thing. So on your periodic table, as I said, you will see the number, the, the, the elements having their atomic masses. So let's see if you can determine which element we're dealing with in this demonstration. So I have a mole of four, four elements, four metals, all right? Right, and so we're, we're, we're going to take the mass and you're going to tell me, so these atoms or these elements, same one mole, that is the same number of particles, right, in them. However, because of how they are packed, some will be heavier than others, all right? So let's try this element. So this is a metal. It's one mole. The mass at this point is 63 grams. Can you figure out which atom or which element is being represented here? having a mole of 63 grams. Sorry, let's get this restarted. Okay, all right. So that mass is 63.1 grams. Which element do you, do you think that is? Uh, when we notice that the, by shifting it, the mass may be affected a bit. All right. So 63 grams. Let's try another one. This is a mole of another element. Works out to be close to 27 grams. So this element, if you know your, your, your elements on your periodic table, 27 grams would represent aluminium. So we understand that this is a mole of aluminium and the mass is 27 grams. Here we have a mole of copper and here the mass is 64 grams. And we'll take one more, a mole of this substance, 55.4 grams, which is about the, the mass of iron. 
So we're, again, we're showing that the mo a mole of that substance, any substance, may work out to have a different mass. And that mass is represented on your periodic table. So we talk about relative atomic mass. So we mentioned earlier that we compare masses to the carbon atom because it is now, it, it is basically the basis for, for comparison. It is stable. And when we compare masses to carbon, then we use the term relative atomic mass, which is the mass of one atom of that particular element, right? Compared to one twelfth the mass of carbon 12. And so because it is a relative measurement, it has no units. So for instance, hydrogen would have a relative atomic mass of one and oxygen would have a relative atomic mass of 16. Now you may also see on your periodic table that chlorine, for instance, the relative atomic mass that is shown is 35.5. Now, you're asking the question, how is that possible? That is possible because of the existence of what we call isotopes. Do you remember what isotopes are? So isotopes are atoms of the same element, but they have different atomic masses, right? Having the same atomic number, they have the same proton number, but a different atomic mass. And generally, that atomic mass is calculated by considering the contribution of all isotopes that make up that element. So let's practice and see what we can use this information to do. So here we have, okay, here we go. The question speaks to, I'm sorry, see them too strong or something. All right, so we have the question looking at potassium. So potassium exists as two isotopes. We have potassium 39 and potassium 41. So we're told that potassium 39 has a mass has a percentage abundance, or what we call the isotopic abundance, is 94%. So what do we do? We write down what our isotopes are. So isotopes, 39 potassium, and 41 potassium, all right? What is the percentage abundance, right? Based on the question, potassium 39 is 94%. And for 41 is 6%, all right? Good. And so to calculate the atomic mass, we would consider the abundance of this isotope. And so it would be the abundance of the isotope, 94% times the atomic mass, right? So the atomic mass for potassium would be 94% of 39 you can see that. And we will add that to 6% of the mass of 41. So what we're saying is that most of the potassium that exists, exists as potassium 39, right? While 6% exists as potassium 41. So based on that, will the mass be closer to 39 or closer to 41? If we work it out, we would see that the mass turns out to be 39.12, right? And so the atomic mass of potassium is 39.12 atomic mass units. And that is how we would uh, account for the presence of isotopes. All right, so let's continue. Now we also have the terms relative, at relative molecular molecular mass and relative formula mass. So when we talk about covalent compounds, these are composed of molecules. And so we use the term relative molecular mass. And what that is really is just um, adding up all the atomic masses of all the atoms in the molecule. So as you can see, water, for instance, we know water, very um, popular compound, H2O, 
means that it has two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So how do I find the relative molecular mass? I would basically multiply the atomic mass of hydrogen, which is one. We, we can get that from our periodic table. And since it's two atoms of hydrogen, it's one times two. And we add that to the atomic mass of oxygen, which is 16. And of course, two plus 16 will give us 18. Now, what happens when we're, we're dealing with substances that, that are not covalent compounds? So if I were to look at sodium chloride, for instance, we would not consider that to be a covalent compound, right? It's an anti compound. And so these compounds, we would use the term relative formula mass because they do not um, exist as molecules. We use the, um, in, 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 instead we say that they are formula units. And so the same method is used just that the name is different. So relative formula mass, again, found by adding all the atomic masses of all the elements or the atoms in that particular formula, and we would get sodium, atomic mass is 23, chlorine, as we found out earlier, was 35.5. When we add those together, the atomic mass, the relative molecular mass in this case is 58.5. Notice again, they have no units. Why is that so? because it is a relative mass. So since it is compared to carbon 12, then it would have no units. Now let's look at molar mass. So you will, though for those of us who would, would have been doing chemistry from grade 10, right? You talk about the molar mass, which is really just the mass of one mole of a substance. But since it is a molar mass, we have to measure this in grams, right? And the units really is grams per mole, G slash M-O-L, or G mole to the minus one, right? And when we're doing calculations, we would be using this quantity, right, in our calculations of masses and moles of substances, all right? So the relative atomic mass, or R-A-M for short, RAM, relative molecular mass, RMM and relative formula mass, they're all expressed. Um, they, they have no units, but when we express them in grams per mole, it represents the molar mass. So let's see if we can apply what we have learned so far. We're gonna try two of these questions as quickly as possible. So we're asked to calculate the relative molecular mass of carbon dioxide, if my memory serves me right, that's the first one. So we have carbon dioxide, all right? So find the RMM of carbon dioxide. So remember, we said that the relative molecular mass is found by adding the atomic masses of all the, ele all the atoms or elements in that compound. So carbon dioxide, of course, very simple, carbon, oxygen, and it's two atoms of oxygen, all right? So to find the RMM, we're adding the atomic mass of carbon, which by now we should know as 12. Oxygen is 16. We have two atoms of oxygen. And so when we add that up, we should get 32 plus 12. That would give us 44. Again, no units because it is RMM. All right, let's try another one. I think we had sulfuric acid on the slide as well. So for sulfuric acid, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of sulfur, four atoms of oxygen. So it is one times two. Hydrogen is one, two atoms of hydrogen. Sulfur is, my bad, 32. Oxygen, we have four oxygen atoms, so it is 16 times four. And when that is added up, two plus 32 plus 64 should give us something like 98 for sulfuric acid. All right. And the same idea would be used to calculate the relative formula mass of potassium hydroxide 
and magnesium sulfate. Same idea, of course. Again, because it is, we're not dealing with covalent compounds in these two examples, we would use the term relative formula mass. All right. Now, a very important part of, of um, using the mole is to be able to write the correct uh, chemical formula. All right. And we find in most cases, you, you see that in the, in the examination reports from CXC, that the students are unable to write a chemical formula, right? They're not able to put the different ions or, or um, substances together to get that correct formula. And if you have an incorrect formula, your calculations will be incorrect, all right? So to write a chemical formula, we're just doing a quick re recap of this. You need to know the valences and or the oxidation state of that particular element. The valency is really the number of electrons that are lost or gained when that atom bonds. So if we think of calcium, calcium is in which group of the periodic table? It's in group two. And so calcium has two outer electrons. And so when calcium bonds, it loses two electrons. And so the valency then would be two. It is also described as the oxidation. Well, we, we can also use the oxidation state of a particular atom or radical. So for instance, the ammonium ion, which is really um, ammonia plus a hydrogen ion, give you the ammonium ion, right? That has a charge of plus one, right? And so that oxidation state would be plus one. And the sulfate ion, which is a polyatomic ion, like, like the ammonium ion, that means it contains two atoms, two different atoms, that charge on the sulfate ion is two minus. And so when we're determining chemical formulae, we must remember these charges and to be able to put up the right formula. So we just do about two of these. How would you determine the formula for lithium chloride? Lithium chloride. So we have to break this down. Lithium is chloride is composed of lithium ions. So that is Li plus as a plus one charge and the chloride ion Cl minus. Now in a forming a compound, we are trying to cancel out the charges. So a compound has no charge. So obviously one lithium, one chloride, plus positive and a negative, we just need one of each. So lithium chloride is LiCl. All right, let's see if we can try zinc hydroxide. Zinc hydroxide would be composed of the ions, zinc, yes, zinc, and zinc is a two plus charge ion, and the hydroxide ion is OH minus, and that is what it would look like, okay? So, Again, remember the objective is to ensure that the charge is cancelled. So if I have a two plus charge, OH is minus one, does that cancel out? No, we need another negatively charged ion. And so you can see that if we have two OH ions, then it would, it would cancel out with a two plus from the zinc. And so the formula for zinc hydroxide is Zn, and in this case we have to bracket the OH to show that it is both it is the, 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 the two is for the entire um, polyatomic ion. So it's two OH and we put that in bracket. Or we don't have time to do all the others, but you can try this for yourself. Try to find the formula for sodium sulfide and for iron three oxide. All right, so let's see if we can make use of this information. Now there is a relationship you'll find between the mass of a substance, the number of moles, and the atomic mass, which I, as I mentioned before, we call that the RAM. So we can see we have a nice little RAM in our, in our picture, just for you to remember. So the RAM is the atomic mass or the molar mass. The mole rep represented by our friendly neighborhood mole and the mass represented by our weight. So how do we use, use this particular information? Let's see if we can uh, show, demonstrate this. So this is called a mole triangle, right? 
So if we want to find the number of moles, so consider blocking this, number of moles is blocked, it would really be the mass divided by the RAM, all right? Or suppose we wanted to find the RAM. RAM would be the mass divided by the moles. And if we wanted to find the mass, if we block that, it would be the moles multiplied by the RAM. And that is how we would use that particular um, formula triangle. All right, so to calculate, to, to calculate the mass of substances, we can use that formula where the number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. And so, again, it's important to see if we can apply this to a question. So this is the question. What is the mass of 1.5 moles of carbon dioxide gas? So we're going to demonstrate this on the board. All right? So if I have... So we have carbon dioxide. That's there already. And so we're finding what is the, the mass of 1.5 moles of carbon dioxide. So if we use that formula that was mentioned earlier, the number of moles is equal to the mass of the substance, and that is in grams, divided by the molar mass, which is in grams per mole, all right? So in this case, we're asked, what is the mass of 1.5 moles of carbon dioxide? So we, want, we have the number of moles, which is 1.5. We don't know the mass, which is what we're trying to find. And we know the atomic mass of carbon dioxide. We found that earlier, but we can just remind ourselves the atomic mass, or in this case, the molecular mass, carbon dioxide, we said we would add all the atoms come making up that, that, that substance, which is 12 plus 16 times 2, and that would give us 44 grams per mole. All right? So we are putting 44 here, and you do your cross-multiplying, we would get x to be equal to 1.5 times 44. Anybody can figure out that what that is? Uh, that would work out to be about uh, half of that, 22 plus 44, 66 grams. All right? And so that is the mass of 1.5 moles of carbon dioxide using that formula. But I find sometimes students mix up that formula. They don't remember exactly where to put the different quantities. And so for me, I recommend using a second approach, which is really just reasoning out the particular problem. So for us, so the same question, we're just using a different approach. All right? So we st always start out with a mole. So we're saying a mole of carbon dioxide has a mass of 44 grams. We just proved that earlier. So that is known, all right? So what is the mass of 1.5 moles? That we don't know, that's x. So using your ratio and proportion, that sort of thing, if one mole is 44, 1.5 moles would be definitely more than 44. So it would really be, we can do our cross multiplication, 1.5 times 44, and that is 66 grams. So here, we're just reasoning out this entire problem, starting from one mole. So we probably won't have enough time to go through all of this. So let us look at the first question, 16 grams of hydrogen. How many moles are present, present in 16 grams of hydrogen? So in this particular case, again, we're thinking that the, the mass of hydrogen, H2, one hydrogen atom has a mass of one. So H2 would be two grams. So one mole has a mass of two grams, right? So if we have 16 grams, 
that would be 16 divided by 2, 8 moles of hydrogen. Okay? And for the second question, what's the mass in grams of 0 0.4 moles of calcium oxide? For this one, we may have to demonstrate this as well. All right, so we have 0 0.4 moles of carb calcium oxide. I chose this one because I wanted you to try to create the formula. So calcium oxide, I noticed I did not give you the formula. You will need to work out this formula using the information that we presented earlier. So calcium is composed, the calcium oxide is composed of calcium ions, which we, we know have a charge of two plus, oxide two minus. Again, we just need both, one of each, calcium oxide, right? The molar mass is 40 plus 16, which is 56. And so if one mole has a mass of 56, 0 0.4 moles would be 0 0.4 times that value. All right? Okay, so we won't have time to do complete all of this today, but what we want you to do is continue practicing these questions because what you find is that uh, for mole, just as in uh, mathematics, the more you practice, the more you'll understand. And so let's go back to our mole challenge that we had earlier. We asked, what do you call a tooth in one liter of solution? And that is a molar solution. I hope you enjoyed that. That's all the time we have for CSEC chemistry.